California legislators are considering laws that I think will destroy the state, and they are anti-scientific, and it looks like they're a product of mass psychosis. Come on, let's go take a look. Hello everyone, Dr. Chris Martinson here with episode 54, and today i uh, very pleased to say that this episode is being sponsored by Secure, secure.com for very secure instant messaging and email a message from them later on. But today, today we got something really important to talk about. So let's go there. Hey, this is episode 54, California's destruction. Um, so as some of you may or may not know, I've been working for quite a while to help however I can in what I consider to be the greatest fight of our lives, which is for our freedom, for our medical freedom, but our larger freedom as individuals. I think we're not doing such a great job on a bunch of fronts. I'd like to fix that. And it begins by making the right decisions and things. That's what I'm really worried about. So I've been helping with the FLCCC. I'm on the board there. I'm also helping the Unity Project. This is a great group of people, really powerful, really well connected, really organized, and they formed around the idea of fighting the K through 12 mandates for vaccination in children. So um, they decided, hey, that should be an individual choice. It shouldn't be a mandate. And they've been organized fighting that ever since. There it is, the Unity Project Online. And uh, hey, they have a strategic advisory council. And uh, there's yours truly, middle, bottom row. But we have also on there Dr. Robert Malone, Paul Alexander, Keith Berkowitz, uh, Dr. Aaron Cariotti, Pierre Corey, uh, Adit Bhagava, uh, Charles Pennick, and Tess Lorry. Great group. Oh, Peter McCullough, one of my favorite all-time people. Just what defines all of these people is super high integrity. If I was ever ill in any way, shape, or form, I'd want one of these people uh, for sure attending to me. And it's just uh, great, my honor, to be working with them. And as well, this is the really solid leadership here. Laura Sextro is the CEO, COO. We're going to be talking to her in just a minute. Um, and then you can see the rest of the leadership team there. Just amazing people. So listen, they just think that we ought to have some sort of science-based discussion around what we're doing. And, you know, there's no scientific rationale at this point left to mandate these particular vaccines against this particular disease, certainly within people below a certain age. That much is startlingly clear. And yet what we're going to be talking about today is that hasn't caught on with people like Justin Trudeau. And it turns out a big swath of the leadership, such as it is, you know, the political cast of characters in Sacramento in California. So let's go there now. Um, Laura Sextro, uh, I've gotten to know her. She's an incredible powerhouse and uh, she's doing a great job with this, but man, she needs our help. So that's why I'm putting this episode together because these bills are just about to come due. Laura, welcome to the program. Great to have you here. Very troubling circumstances, of course. Uh, so listen, take us through this. What is going on in California? Uh, wow. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, California is absolutely in a state of disarray. They're, they're de- it's a total destruction, really, of our freedoms, and particularly uh, for the parents, it's a total loss of parental rights. What's happening right now is we have eight bills that are potentially going to be voted on in the next couple of weeks that are so incredibly dangerous, and I'd love to just run through them. So let's start out with AB 1993. Um, AB 1993 is a bill that would require employers to verify vaccine status for their employees. And your viewers may say, all, well- All employers? all employers and your viewers may think any well, size just go through that any size so any size oh. and any employment status so whether they're a w-2 employee or this is the most important fact an independent contractor so what that means is you will not be able to work in the state of california in any capacity whether it's an independent contractor as an uber driver or something like that um, or a w-2 employee unless you prove your vaccine status um, the other one that, that's that's kind of next on the list that's equally scary is AB 1749, so 1749. And this is a bill that will require schools to come up and maintain, so come up with and maintain testing protocol for their students, their staff, and their teachers. And of course, testing you might say, for COVID? Testing for COVID. So you might say, well, why, mm -hmm. why are they doing that if vaccines work? Right. Uh, but the most dangerous part of this particular bill is that it will require 
that schools, once they get the test results, they then send those results to the California Department of Health. And, and as we go through these bills, you'll understand why that's so dangerous. The next one is AB 1797, which is a vaccine passport bill. So essentially it merges three different um, California immunization tracking systems into one system and government agencies will have access to that. I think it goes without say why we believe that's dangerous. Um, SB 866. Well, go, go ahead and tell us. Why, why are you worried about that one? Oh my gosh, well, I'm concern? worried about that because it's an absolute government overreach. So I should not have to prove my vaccine status to go out and enjoy a meal with my family, go to the movies, mm -hmm. or frankly, just engage in day-to-day -day life. Um, these are basic human rights. I mean, this, this is something that in my opinion is likened to what was happening kind of Nazi Germany circa 1940 and when they were interning people and they're segregating people based on um, their status, obviously in that it was based on whether or not you were a Jewish person or other ethnicity. Now it's based on what your vaccine status is. And I can't think of any no. quicker way um, mm -hmm. to segregate the population. And then this is, by the way, uh, the first step in um, mo modern, excuse me, um, automating your, like a, like a uh, social status, right? So we all now, in order to engage in any type of activity within mainstream society, this is the first step in um, starting to track that, right? So we hear about this yep. kind of dystopian future society. So I'll, I, I keep cutting you off, go ahead. No, no, it's quite, I'm, I'm really excited by this and also horrified by it. The, the first question I have is, look, you know, you work with people like Paul Alexander and um, Robert Malone is is also on the uh, board there and, and uh, mm -hmm. or at least executive team. So so there's a lot of competent scientists. Here's my problem. Do any of these bills actually say because we can prove that these vaccines have a defined outcome that's very favorable, we're going to take these necessary steps to intrude upon the lives and livelihoods of individuals and businesses. Have they have they closed that gap in any of these bills? No, that's an excellent Because these vaccines don't stop transmission and they wear off relatively quickly to the point that in the UK, they just reported nine out of 10 people who died were fully vaccinated uh, from COVID. Correct. And so one would have to ask, what is what is the intent behind this when you have um, when you're mass vaccinating and in particular in the, the pediatric population where children are at statistically zero risk unless they have multiple significant comorbidities, they're at zero risk. They're not vectors of transmission. So you, one mm -hmm. would have to wonder, why are we pushing so hard? to vaccinate the pediatric population. And when you talk about the fact that they, uh, these vaccines do not stop, stop the transmission, so you can still acquire and you can still transmit the virus even after having been vaccinated. You just said there's a lot of scientific data coming out now that people who are vaccinated, in fact, are um, having higher and experiencing higher mortality rates than people who are unvaccinated. So this whole concept of public health and safety should be off the table, right? Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty darn scary. And as you, as we continue to go through the bills, I think you will get more and more horrified. Uh, SB 866 is a bill mm -hmm. that does two things. It lowers the age of consent for children down to the age of 12. So think about that for a second. I just took my daughter the other day to get her ears pierced. She's 16 years old. I had to show my ID and I had to sign a document stating that I was giving authorization for her to get her ears pierced. But now in the state of California, they want to lower the age to 12 years old for children to engage in a medical decision that could potentially severely harm them or end their life, have irreparable long-term consequences. Think about that. In addition to lowering wow. the age of consent, it also takes away the personal belief exemption. And you may say, well, what about uh, medical exemptions? Aren't those available still? And the answer to that would be absolutely not. Medical practitioners in the state of California and really throughout the country, but in, in California are being hunted. And if you look at um, AB 2098, AB 2098 basically states that medical providers must promote the vaccines. And what I mean by that is, and I'm, I'm going to read this to you, the, the actual language that's in the bill. It basically- and Laura, this is another Senate bill, right? This is another uh, that, Senate that's, bill. That's uh, up, uh, up for consideration. All right. That's right. In California. Hit me with it. All what right. It says um, that it basically classifies any anti-COVID medical opinion as, quote, 
unprofessional conduct sub, uh, subject to discipline by the medical board. And we all know that any doctor recently in the last two years that has been engaging in any type of practice that goes against the uh, mainstream narrative using remdesivir, uh, keeping patients on ventilators, which we know had a very bad outcome for patients. We know that these doctors have been hunted and a lot of them are losing their licenses. So this is just a further mechanism for the state to come in and strip them of their ability to practice medicine. Oh, oh you use some language in there. I don't even understand. What is an anti-COVID medical opinion? What Do they define that? They don't define it. And I think that's very intentional and by design, right? So the, really, I think we can see based on his, the last two years of history with doctors and what's happening, that would be any doctor that advises a patient that getting a vaccine is not um, probably appropriate for them. Uh, that would be any doctor that states that uh, early treatments such as ivermectin, hydrochloroquine, fluvoxamine, any of the drugs that we know are effective early treatment um, protocols, so any doctor that talks about that will then be subjected to uh, process, legal process and legal procedures from the California Department of Health under AB 2098 should this bill pass. Hmm. Pretty wild, right? Wow. So so this this is getting legislators even further up the medical grill, as it were. So so yeah, who who wouldn't want their medicine to be dictated right. by random state legislators from time to time? <laughs> exactly. That, I mean, that's what exactly. it sounds like. Well, and right? then I mean, look at AB nine twenty. AB nine twenty would give um, authorization for the medical board to inspect doctors' offices, uh, patient records without patient consent. So at any time- Isn't that a HIPAA violation? That, right, that's a direct HIPAA violation. However, this is a bill, Senate Bill 920, that is going to be voted on in the next couple of weeks in the state of California. Think about how so, invasive that is. So th that's, okay, this, this, my horror is mounting now. Um, here's a question. How, how aware are people, or in particular, would are other even state legislators, like how aware are people of these bills? Like, like, is there a chance these things just come up for a floor vote and there's eight people on the floor and they pass? Or I don't know. I mean, uh, I, how how aware are people of all this? I'm so grateful for that question. It's, it's incredibly scary in the state of California how... Um, unaware people are. I actually had the opportunity to uh, engage in a couple of speaking events over the last week. And one of them in particular was very alarming. Uh, it was with the California Republican Assembly. And, um, you know, these are all incredible individuals that are fighting for the freedoms in our state and, and in particular, um, this country. And these are people that in some cases uh, have very deep political ties. And they, I would say about 5% of people um, out of about 200, we're actually aware of the bill, these particular bills. And I got to tell you, as I go about my day to day life, I ask people, and it is incredibly rare that I encounter even one person that is aware that these bills are going to be up for a vote in the next couple of weeks in the state of California. So now who's proposing these bills? Who, who is it? Do you know? <laughs> Well, in large part, the author to a lot of these bills is Senator Richard Pan, and he mm -hmm. has um, a history of presenting bills like this. And sadly, he also has a history of being wildly successful with getting these bills passed. If you look at some of the other vaccine uh, vaccines that are on the um, the dockets right now that are that in order to go to school in the state of California, those were all authored by Re uh, Senator Richard Pan. So um, he, in large part, is is the author but you've got a lot of support believe it or not and again i want to i want to say unity project is not a partisan group um, mm -hmm. we don't care what your what your belief systems are in terms of politics uh, but we believe that this is a human rights issue not a right left independent libertarian issue uh, that being said it just happens to be that a lot of the left-leaning um, politicians in the state of california are actually in support of these bills. They will not break with party lines and vote against this. We do have a few um, more right-leaning politicians in the state of California that are that are expressing that they will go in opposition to that. But unfortunately, that I don't think that we're going to have enough votes to to squash a lot of these dangerous, dangerous bills. And we haven't even finished. Um, AB or excuse me, SB eight seven one is a bill that will add the COVID-19 vaccine 
to the already existing vaccine list for children to attend school. So keep in mind, I've already said, they have to go through testing. Those test results will be filed with California Department of Health. They can lower the age of consent down to 12. Uh, there's no personal belief exemption. And now they're also talking about making sure that children do not attend school, whether it's private or public, without being vaccinated for COVID-19. And there is nothing in the language of this bill that states that it must be FDA approved. So they're looking to force uh, vaccinate children under an emergency use authorization. It's, it's, it's wow. Incredible. And, and, and vaccinated, of course, is a slippery term, right? Does that mean you've had two jabs of the mRNA vaccines? Do you need three? Is it four? Is it, you know, based on some, is it going to be every four months? I mean, we don't know, right? Right. And that, well, there's been talk, right? If you listen to some of these politicians, I think that it, that it's no secret. They're expecting to put this on the list and see children vaccinated and boosted every six months to a year in order to get a an education in the state of California, which is why we say, listen, if should these bills pass, you will not be able to live, work, or learn in the state of California should any of these bills pass. And the last wow. one that, that to me is probably the single most frightening bill, as if these weren't terrifying enough, is SB 1464, which will require law enforcement to enforce California Department um, of Health guidelines. So think about that for a second. That would essentially mean that if I am required by the state in order to send my child to school to get my child vaccinated, the police could end up knocking on my door should I choose as a parent to practice my parental rights um, to not vaccinate my child, right? And I just wanna say, and I think, I think you know this, and I'm pretty sure your audience knows this, but none of us are operating under informed consent. Um, we don't know what's in these vaccines. We're starting to slowly learn some of the, the terrifying things that are, that are happening as a result of these vaccines as they release the Pfizer documents. But none of us are operating under informed consent. And so they're, and in addition to that, they're now overlaying laws that will require you to vaccinate yourself, vaccinate your children. And if you do not comply, you will be subjected to um, law enforcement and legal ramifications. Now, Laura, so I, I mean, let's just not even in an extreme case, but let's imagine I'm a parent. I live in California. I know that my child has had a particularly bad experience with, say, the first jab. Took them down, did my duty, um, exposed my child to some risk, but they had a bad reaction. They had an anaphylactic reaction, or they just weren't right for a, a while, or even maybe they experienced mild myocarditis, as some people call it, or whatever the story is. Are you saying that there's no no latitude in these bills for me to then say, as the parent of this child, no, this is not in my child's best interest to continue to participate in this? That is correct. From a personal belief exemption standpoint, you will not have the ability to um, exercise that right. They, now they'll come back and say, well, you can get a medical exemption. Good luck finding a medical practitioner that will be willing to write a medical exemption in the state of California. Oh, so, and don't forget, we you can get a medical exemption maybe from a provider who could lose their entire livelihood if they provide one, right? Exactly, exactly. And you know, yeah. as, as Dr. Aaron Cariotti always says, this is not like if you go up for a review against the, the board and you lose your license, it's not like being fired from a job. You will never practice medicine again. And mm. unfortunately, they are absolutely corrupting um, and dismantling the entire medical system as a result of this. All right. So these are pretty horrifying to me and I hope to most people, but but clearly not to everybody. So, hey, how can people get involved? What can they do? So what are you asking? What's the ask here for people? Well, I appreciate that question. Uh, go to unityproject.com. We would love to have you join our mailing list. We put together joint mm -hmm. calls to action. We have 120. Uh, we launched with 120 strategic partners across the state of California. And the most recent thing that we are going to be doing, we're going to be calling on our strategic partners to mobilize a force of volunteers. I would love to see thousands of volunteers across the state going door to door, uh, going to farmer's markets, going to grocery stores. And we're creating did you know fact sheets and we are gonna have boots on the ground and have people out there talking to the citizens of this state because I don't think people are aware of what's happening. They, the, the, the state of California has gone to great lengths to hide these bills. This is not something hmm. that they're openly publicizing. 
And there's a specific reason for that, because I believe that should the average person in the state of California read these bills, they would be horrified and they would do everything they could to make sure that their elected officials knew that they were in opposition and that when it comes to the next election, uh, it will be reflected in who, get, in who gets replaced. So uh, get involved, go to unityproject.com and um, you know, uh, join our, our joint calls to action. And if you can't get involved and you can donate, donations are always welcome. We always need um, additional resources. This is a big fight that we have in front of us. I feel confident that we can win. It's really a matter of making sure that people wake up and they understand what's happening in this state and really in this country. Because you know the saying, right? Um, as, as California goes, so does the rest of the nation. Yeah, I'm seeing the same sorts of legislative out put in uh, New York state seems to have a, a, a little flurry of awful legislation as well. But but these are really the beachheads for sort of this type of thinking, which is, let's be clear about this. It's not American to me. It's not about freedom. It's not about science. It's not about health. It's about something else. Right. And and so it's not surprising to hear that the state of California uh, people who are promoting these things are acting a little bit like Justin Trudeau here. You know, they're they're trying to do it under the cover of darkness and, you know, shame from a distance, not take any calls and pretend like they're they're still the good people in this story. Um, well, so good luck they, with this fight. Thank you. I appreciate um, the opportunity to be on. I appreciate all the work that you do with us. Chris, you're amazing. And I do thank think you. we can win yeah. this if we if we continue to press forward. So thanks for having me. Well, my pleasure. And you're doing really important work. Thank you for taking you know time out of your life to head this up and everybody involved in the Unity Project. What what a what a massive outpouring. And by the way, my kind of peeps, right? Um, and it's not partisan. It's not partisan. It's no not left right. It's up down, right? You know. And so we have to win these fights. So thank you and thank you for your time today. All right. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Hey, huge thanks to Laura again and to the Unity Project for doing this, putting their effort and their lives on the line, their livelihoods, as well as spending all this time helping to get this word out. Happy to do whatever I can to help sped, spread the word. Why? Because what happens in California tends to happen elsewhere in the country, as Laura said. So this is a critical beachhead. If we don't get this right, if Laura, if, if Laura's right and uh, you know fails and her organization doesn't get it done and we don't help in the right ways, if California passes those laws, you can feel that nibbling. It's like being eaten by piranhas, right? Oh, you know, we're just going to pass this little law about age of consent and all this and that. So I want to look up these laws because, I mean, they sound pretty bad. Are they really that bad? So let's take a look at a couple of them now. Let's do this. Um, here's Senate Bill 866, which she mentioned it authorizes a minor 12 years of age or older to consent to vaccines without parental knowledge or or consent. Um, certainly hope those 12 year olds understand things like their prior medical history, if they have any myocarditis, if they happen to have any latent underlying diseases, autoimmune diseases, cancers, and or if they've ever had an anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine before. Hmm. You know, that might be something a mom or a dad would know that maybe a 12 year old might not quite fully be cognizant of. It's a reason we have the age of majority a little bit older than 12, not totally a fully formed human. I understand that. You understand that. California, little having trouble on the concept, at least for some of them. And who? Well, this was introduced by Senators Weiner and Pan. Dr. Pan. Hmm, a Pan. Seems like I remember that name. Principal co-author is Assembly Member Wicks. Co-author, Senator Newman. Co-authors down in the Assembly, Aguiar Curry, uh, Friedman scratched out there, Lo Ting, and Akilo Weber. Let's just remember those names because I think we're going to hear a few of those as we go forward. So take a look here in the bill itself. It says, well, in yellow, existing law already prescribes various circumstances under which a minor, a minor may consent to their medical care and treatment without the consent of a parent or guardian. So hey, it's already on the books. We already, we already do these things. Under what circumstances? Well, those include, among others, um, authorizing a minor 12 years of age or older who may have come into contact with an infectious, contagious, or communicable disease to consent to medical care related to the diagnosis or treatment of the disease if the disease or condition is one that is required by law or regulation to be reported to the local health officer or a sexually transmitted disease. Hmm. So this bill would additionally authorize a minor 12 years of age or older to consent to vaccines that meet specified federal agency criteria. 
Now, what have we just learned with all of the FDA hiding the Pfizer documents? We've watched those Pfizer documents come out, and they don't know all kinds of things about these vaccines. They don't know how long the mRNA kicks around. They don't know how much spike protein is delivered and, um, and generated. They don't know what those things do in certain people. They can't explain why some lots seem to have worse effects than others. None of You can't have informed consent without the information. So that's part one. Part two is how do you have a, a minor 12 years of age or older make that informed consent decision? So if they can't make it, somebody has to make it for them. This is horrifying to me. I think that it should be a decision that's made completely within the context of a family in terms of what they want to do or not want to do. Hey, I'm very libertarian when it comes to this. Look, look, I, I'm even this far. If somebody wants to do drugs, go ahead. Right. Uh, it should be a, uh, maybe a, a medical issue for them to work out a civil issue, but criminal not not my business, right? So if somebody wants to go skydiving a lot of times or wants to go bungee jumping and without checking the equipment first, whatever, people get to, to live their lives how they wish. Um, so this is just something that I just, this is, this is pretty horrifying to me. But why the urgency to have these vaccines in particular, knowing what we know now about how this disease does not impact people of that age. Anybody below the age of 30, 20, for sure, but 30, eh, really a non-thing. Um, so let's let's start with that. Well, I remember this Pan, this Dr. Pan, Richard Pan. Richard Pan, he's a pediatrician, California State Senator. He wrote this opinion piece saying once, uh, this was back in 2021, he wrote, anti-vaccine extremism is akin to domestic terrorism. Hyperbole? Not to, not to him. This guy, uh, wow, he's really, he's honorary co-chair of something called readytovaccinate.org. I mean, come on, you can kind of feel his bias. Listen, I don't, you know what? If somebody's really pro-vaccine, that is fine. If they want to be a pediatrician and a doctor, I would expect them to bring with them the data. I don't want them to coerce me. I don't want them to shame me, punish me, make rules, fine me, any of that stuff for any medical treatment. Right. If suddenly Dr. Richard Pan decided that chopping off left feet was the best thing ever and wanted to pass a law to criminalize people who still had intact left feet, I'm not OK with that either. Right. If you want to come to me with data explaining why you think this vaccine in this age group is the right thing to do, then bring the data. Let's have it. Full throated discussion. I got data. You got data. Let's take a look at it. Look at what he wrote here. Vaccines don't stop viruses. Vaccinations do. Well, that was a little premature, wasn't it, Dr. Pan, um, Richard, Dick? Because uh, this vaccine doesn't actually stop the virus. But we knew that. Even when you wrote this back in February of 2021, we already knew that. That should have been completely obvious to you as a pediatrician, because it was completely obvious to me as a pathologist and an armchair one at that. Um, you know, so it just, at any rate... He also wrote, this common public health saying means a vaccine does no good if we can't get it into people's arms. So that's his goal. We want to get it into people's arms. Well, what about we run the risk-benefit analysis, right? There should be some risk-benefit analysis. And you have to at least start with what is the overall harm from being unvaccinated versus the harm of being vaccinated. That's the risk profile. And then what's the overall benefit of being vaccinated versus the benefit of not being vaccinated, risk benefit. You would look at all the dimensions of this. It's not just vaccines, good, anti-vaxxers, terrorists, right? That's just too black and white. It's part of the mass psychosis programming, right? It's Remember, mass psychosis is that condition where you create this vague threat and then you have these ironclad, ritualistic, somewhat abusive responses to that, that ultimately when you strip away the gobbledygook result in a bunch of people not using their cortical centers, using their emotional centers, and they do very bad things. They burn witches. Um, they inject people with things that who don't need to be injected with anything. So that's who Dr. Pan is. I think we got a beat on this guy from this op-ed in the Washington Post. By the way, Washington Post, really bad job allowing this junk into your newspaper. I know why you did it, but it was really uncool, and you should know that. All right. So um, 
Well, uh, I guess I couldn't say these kinds of things in California next year if this bill passes, because here's another one that was uh, put up there by Dr. Richard Pan, Dick Pan. Um, there it is, introduced by Senator Pan. Let me get my drawing tool out here. Uh, check this out. Yeah, Senator Pan here. What is this one? This is uh, Senate Bill number 1390, and it says... Well, you know, existing law already prohibits a person, among others, from making dis- or disseminating any advertising device, uh, blah, 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 blah. Listen, you can't do libel, so that's already part of the law. But down in green, they say this bill also now would extend our libel laws and would provide that harmful content includes libel or slander, as already specified, threats of imminent violence against government entities and disinformation or misinformation, including but not limited to false or misleading information regarding medicine or vaccinations, false or misleading information regarding elections and conspiracy theories. (laughs) A little vague, (laughs) a little broad. Uh, Yeah, because who defines what's a conspiracy theory? Listen, all these conspiracy theories I heard about last year are just facts this year. Um, What about uh, why misleading information regarding elections? Well, listen, our elections are anything but open and verifiable. They're a complete shit show compared to any other country I'm aware of that's of our so-called standing in the United States. So there's definitely room for questioning it within the context of those things um, until we improve the systems, right? So they become verifiable. Remember, elections, not something you should trust ever. You should be able to verify them always. We can't do that. Why? Beats me, but neither party really seems interested in it. So, so, but to specifically call that out and say that this bill in California is going to provide some sort of a remedy against any content that includes is disinformation, misinformation. Da, da, da. This is I'm going to call this one 1390. I'm going to call this the Justin Trudeau Act. Right? This has that same vibe. Doctor, you know, the Senator Pan has that same sort of like Justin Trudeau vibe. Can you feel it? Right? Hiding away terrified that somebody's going to actually like point a finger at him or maybe say, Hey, how dare you do dumb stuff like this? And then, you know, want to just like legislate everything and, and be, um, really draconian and overbearing to try and force everybody to be how he wants them to be. And it's really, it's really unappealing. I got to say, uh, in yellow quote, this bill would require a social media platform to establish a complaint process for users to access within the platform to report harmful content they believe has been amplified and track each complaint in a database that is shared with the attorney general as specified. This bill would authorize the enforcement of these provisions by civil action in a court of competent jurisdiction by the attorney general. The bill would exempt any information shared with the attorney general pursuant to this chapter from disclosure under the public California public records act. Well, these records won't be public. It's going to be a secret list. It's going to go to the attorney general about people who are spreading misinformation um, about medicine. (laughs) How do you spread misinformation about medicine? All of science is getting it wrong and then getting it right or over time, right? That's the, the, basically this is the let's stop medicine act. Let's stop progression. We're good. As far as everything we need to know about medicine, we now know. Because any dissent from traditional, conventional, already enshrined orthodoxy around medicine would obviously be misinformation. Because people have generally agreed what medicine is. (laughs) This this is, can't make this up. So listen, this may or may not pass. I'm not a political analyst in, in any stripe. And I can't even pretend to know what chance a bill like this has of passing in California. But that it even got written tells me something really dark about where we are in this particular story. That it was even considered tells us something. That there are people backing this, introduced and then co-sponsoring this, tells us something. There are people who think this way. I don't think this way. I'm guessing maybe you don't think this way, but people do. And this is really, really, really destructive. I think that these people, if they get their way and they create this condition of, you know, sort of soft official terror, right? Where careful what you say because some, you know, nebulous database you can't see may have flagged you to the attorney general as spreading medical misinformation or a conspiracy theory. Um, Remember last year it was a conspiracy theory that Hunter Biden's laptop was real. Now it's not. 
right? So I guess last year in California, if this bill had been up and running, the attorney general would have been able to do something, you know, take you to court and you know, levy a big fat civil uh, uh, penalty against you or try to if you had talked about something that is now a proven fact. So I wonder if there's any remedy in this bill for if you get dinged and slammed and you have to pay a huge fine, but then next year it turns out that thing you got fined for turns out to be factually correct, not a conspiracy theory. I wonder what the remedy is. I'm going to guess there isn't one because that's not how people like this role. Uh, they absolutely disgust me to no end. All right. Uh, how about this one? Oh, let me move this down a tiny bit so we can see all of it. This is bill number 1464 here, uh, which Laura mentioned as well. Let's take a look closer. This requires, uh, again, introduced um, by Senator Pan. I don't know what this guy's up to, but he seems to be in a little bit of a panicky hurry. Justin Trudeau style. This is the Trudeau of California. Um, you know, just like at any rate, it used to be that existing law authorized in yellow each sheriff to enforce all orders of the state department of public health. It authorized them. Now it's going to require the sheriffs and peace officers to enforce those orders. Now, well, wait a minute. What orders would come from the de Department of Public Health? This is just an order. It's not a law. It's not like somebody voted somebody like this horrifyingly bad, terrible, awful, no good Senator Pan into existence. And then they pr proposed a bill and people voted on it in the Senate, in the House. And then the next thing you know, you have a law. This is a public health order. These could be public health officials not voted in, appointed or hired in, bureaucrats. And they get to now create law that the sheriff would have to enforce, would be required to to enforce an order. This isn't how any of this is supposed to work. I don't like, here's the thing. I'm a little bit of a conservative for sure. When it comes to the idea that one does not simply muck around with hundreds of years of established legal precedent without careful consideration, this whole idea that the sheriffs who are the highest law enforcement authority in the land, the sheriffs, you may or may not know this in the United States can actually refuse anything up to a Supreme court edict and say, nah, not, nah, not, not enforcing that. Right. They can decide for themselves. They get to choose. It's an incredible power to strip that power away, to skinny that down and to make the sheriffs now subservient to the order of a public health authority. It's literally subverts hundreds of years of established power and structure. One does not simply do that because we think it's a good idea because of pandemic because we're a little because we're a little scared triple mast right <laughs> just come on but this is how these people roll if i can say whoever whoever richard pan represents um represents people who are not conservative in the sense that they have a new utopia that they see and they need to get there as fast as possible and they're willing to just toss aside precedents laws established conventions um cultural mores whatever because there's a better future out there and their better future involves you thinking exactly like they do when they want you to think it in the way they want you to think it. When they change their minds later, you got to change your mind with them too. That's just how I see this all going. Anyway, horrible law. It's being voted on here, I believe, on March 30th. So this is being recorded here and being put out on March 23rd. So we have seven days to figure out how to make some noise about this and say, nah, please don't do this. In fact, running down that list of things that Laura had just told us about from SB 1479, introduced by Senator Pan with co-authors of Senators Newman and Wiener. Um, AB 1797, introduced by Assembly Member Alika Weber, principal co-author, Senator Pan, co-authors, um, Assembly Members Lowe and Wicks, co-authors that are Senators Newman and Wiener. Uh, AB 1993, introduced by Wicks, Curry, Lowe, Alika Weber, principal co-authors, Senators Newman, Pan, Wiener. You getting, you getting the vibe here yet? <laughs> There's like the same names keep showing up. It's almost like they're a little club. Uh, AB 2098, introduced by Assemblymember Lowe, co-authors, Aguirre Curry, uh, Alika Weber, and Wicks. Co-authors are Senators Pan and Wiener. <laughs> see, see how this is working out? Uh, SB 871. Um, oh, by the way, just in case, dip, let's cover all those again. 1479 mandates schools to continue COVID-19 testing and give all that information to the department 
um, to the, the health department. Uh, the next one down creates one statewide California immunization registry tracking system for all vaccines to be entered into the California immunization registry. Schools and other entities would have access to all vaccine records. We need a centralized database of all our subjects, right? AB 1993 requires an employer to require each employee or contractor, independent contractor to receive the vaccine. Requires it. Hey, and you're going to have to track it, business. Here's a cost for you. Oh, let me see if there's any funding for you. Nope. That's another cost for you. Uh, just how it rolls, right? It must be fun passing a law where I pass the law and you have to bear all the all the burden of that law. And I we don't have to bear any, not even raising taxes to pay for it. Like, make it easy on myself. Uh, AB 2098 allows the medical board to take action against doctors who promote information deemed misinformation. All the same people wanting the same thread of stuff. This is dangerous, horrifyingly anti-American, terrible, no good stuff. These laws are what are going to shred this country and make things not good. All right. Uh, SB 871 mandates children be immunized with COVID-19 in order to attend school or daycare. Remove the personal belief exemption for any additional vaccine requirements added by the California Department of Health. Um, And you can see who introduced it. All the same names again. SB 920 authorizes medical board to inspect a doctor's office and records without patient's consent. Hmm. Little HIPAA violation there, anyone? SB 1184 authorizes a healthcare provider or service plan to disclose your child's medical information to school linked services coordinator without parental consent, circumventing HIPAA and FERPA laws. Hmm. Well, isn't that fun? So th- now let's ask ourselves why? Why these laws? Why this sudden rush to get all these laws in place? I'll tell you why. Um, because. COVID's ending. This is what I said back in December 22, 2021, so a number of months ago. Conclusions to episode 40 in yellow. Omicron spells the end of the COVID crisis. I saw that coming. If you actually look at when these bills were introduced, a lot of them were in January, some in February, but most of them right around January. I believe that Dick Pan also saw the end of the of the COVID run and didn't want to let this crisis go to waste. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, there's so many good things we could get out of this if we could just, you know, ride the tail ends of the COVID fear. Let's get all this creepy stuff. We'll be able to boot doctors out who don't follow COVID principle, you know, who, who, <laughs> who don't follow all of our prescribed mandates. We can, you know, force kids to get vaccinated and track them and get them used to being jabbed twice a year. Gosh, how could we let this all pass? I believe that Dick's a smart guy. I believe Dr. Pan, smart guy, saw the same thing I did, same thing you did, which is that Omicron spelled the end of COVID, didn't want to let this crisis go to waste. And by the way, that's what I was saying on December 22nd, just for a little blast of the past. This is what the media was saying on that same day. I was like, oh, please just stop. Come on. This fear porn. I mean, it's just like read this stuff. Omicron now dominant fears widen, spreading fast, alarming battles. You know, it's just well, man, who cares? Bill Gates cancels his holiday plans due to Omicron. Who cares? I don't care anything about what that guy says. So, what justifications could there be? What could there be for those proposed California laws? First, the first justification could be that COVID is a deadly pandemic, and we have to do these things. Sometimes you have to take big, bold steps in the face of a true crisis. Uh, you know what? COVID isn't really a deadly pandemic, certainly not in kids, and actually not across the general population. I mean, it certainly can be a very bad thing that you don't want to get above a certain age, above a certain morbidity level. Absolutely, I get it. But there are early treatments out there, and there's lots of ways to attend to this. But even without early treatments, this thing had a K, an infection fatality rate, it looks like, of about... By the way, um, CDC has just dialed back its estimates of how many people actually died of COVID, right? So we know that. So eh, COVID is not a deadly pandemic. Well, how about this? Vaccines present a favorable risk-reward ratio. Well, actually, they provide almost no benefit at all to people who already don't die or get seriously ill from COVID. If you already don't get sick and you don't die, and the vaccine doesn't stop you from spreading this thing around, the vaccine provides... Let me add that up. Carry the one. Yeah, zero benefit. Lots of risk, though, potentially, right? Because we know about that myocarditis as well as many, many other things. All right. So vaccines actually do not present a favorable risk reward ratio to the extent that you would say we have to mandate this as a matter of public emergency. So eh, that one doesn't work out. All right. 
Uh, children. We have to vaccinate the children because they are significant disease vectors. Uh, no, they're not, actually. So eh, we can't do that one either. They really don't pass it along that well. How about this one? Uh, misinformation. Hey, we've analyzed it. Misinformation only comes from outside sources, outsiders, you know, and is proven to be harmful. Proven. Uh, whereas the central health authorities always get things right and really don't need any outside interference. Hmm. So let's pass some laws to criminalize people questioning what our authorities are saying, because our authorities are infallible. <laughs> Do I have to? That's not right. I'll give that two. I'll get that one double, double X. That come on. It's just horrifying to me that anybody would even dare to suggest that maybe, possibly. We're getting things right at that level? Not happening. So what could it be? Oh, these laws will increase the power and the control of the state over private business and citizens. Ding! That's the only answer I can come up with for why these particular laws are being proposed by these particular people. So if I lived in California, which I don't, and by the way, I wouldn't, not under this set of laws, but um, uh, you got to vote these people out. You, You just have to. I mean, it's just, and I think they, I think they know how badly they're polling at this point in time and how sick we all are of being treated this way and how sick we are that they're even proposing laws like this and just sick of the whole vibe. Everything about this is just gross, right? So at any rate, uh, that's the only justifications I could see for these particular proposed California laws. And remember, if you show me the incentive, I will show you the outcome. I predict very bad things for California if they pass any of these laws, let alone all of them. All of them will be a complete disaster for California state's finances in future. Because if you show me the incentive, I will show you the outcome. So California is already a ridiculously expensive state with ridiculously onerous laws and is ridiculously in people's lives. And some people don't like that. Some people. Typically, your most mobile people. So guess what? More people are leaving California, not just during the pandemic, but it turned out in 2020, new entrances to the state dropped in every county in California since the end of March 2020. Entrances to California from other states have dropped 38% since March of last year. This was written in December of 2021, while the number of residents leaving to other states has increased 12%. So this is a report from nonpartisan California Policy Lab. Easy prediction to make, California. If you let these power-hungry legislators destroy people's lives and intrude into people's lives and get between parents and their children to a greater extent than they already are, you're going to lose more people. And here's the thing. You know who you lose? You tend to lose the most mobile people. Those are people who can get up and leave. You know who those tend to be? That's right. They tend to be your wealthier, more successful people. They tend to be entrepreneurs. They tend to be your business people. So they leave. They bring all their tax money with them. And then they leave behind the people who need more of those services. And, you know, it's really not a good combination. The trend is already in play. I can't believe California hasn't figured this out yet. But people like Senator Pan have proven to be ridiculously bad at understanding this saying. They don't get, it's like they don't, they don't human. Like they don't understand like that if you treat somebody badly, they probably are going to want to react to that in some way and get out of Dodge, right? I don't know why they don't understand it. It seems obvious to me. So episode 54 conclusions here, uh, the mass psychosis, it continues. uh, All of those laws proposed are just examples of mass psychosis to the extent that people legitimately think they're a good idea, not just they're cravenly, shallowly, uh, very, you know, um, self-interestedly like promoting laws that they get rich off of or more powerful off of. Like to the extent they believe them, it's because of mass psychosis. California legislating its own demise um, into unbearable laws. Just that's how this would happen. If these laws pass any of them, but let alone all of them, the California exodus is going to continue, if not increase cause and effect incentives, freedom versus tyranny, those subtleties, all those things, those seem to be escaping the California legislators. So guess what? If I lived there, I'd already be in the process of leaving. I'd be trying to fight these, but you can see the writing on the wall. These people like Justin Trudeau, they don't stop. They just keep trying and they're just going to keep trying until uh, they're all voted out of office. And if you don't do that, uh, which is hard to do all at once, um, guess what? Uh, They get their way eventually. So uh, if you live there, please consider leaving maybe um, if you can. And if you can't, oh man, you have my sympathy. But this is really important, though. Everybody shouldn't just pick up and leave California. I'm not suggesting that because 
if we lose California on this front, those other laws are going to spread to other places. It's kind of how it works. This is, this is Normandy Beach. We're going to have to storm this beach. Please do what you can to help prevent this. If you can't, please write letters. You know, Donate to the Unity Project if you can, because they'll pick up the mantle and go forward. But this has to be stopped. These are crazy, crazy laws. So I just wanted to bring those to your attention. By the way, um, we're going to be doing part two over at my website, which is... Uh, Hey, I think we're in for a really rough landing. Uh, there's an extraordinary energy crisis. I have to, it's, listen, it's just I'm just bringing data, but I'm going to talk about what I see in that regard. And, and when I say rough landing, I mean sort of in a financial economic sense. So some things brewing over there. Love to see you there. We've got three brand new uh, membership packages over there. If you like this kind of information, if you like being early to things, right? I tend to be a little too early sometimes, but I'm early. So if you, I was early to... Uh, Various economic crises have happened early to the COVID story, early, early, early to all sorts of things. That's who I am. Uh, so if you like being early, come on over and take advantage of our information scout level package. Uh, you'll like hearing more of what I had to say. And if you want to be part of a community, though, we have other packages for insiders as well as for our VIPs, people who support this mission, support this channel, help us do what we do. These are the people who um, are going to help us really uh, bring our message out into the larger world and help me do what I do. So thank you to everybody who supports this channel. Thanks everybody. Hit the like button, hit subscribe. If you want to stay subscribed to this channel, thank you so much for listening today and uh, come on by peak prosperity for part two. And now, Hey, secure messaging, secure email, really important topics. Let's hear now from our sponsor. And now a word from the sponsor of today's program, secure spelled S E K U R. Secure is a private and secure instant messaging and email service. All communication is held securely in Swiss servers without using any of the big tech platforms. Listen, in today's day and age, your email or messages or even bank information can easily be intercepted by bad actors. Your private information, pictures, chat, and email are consistently mined and sold by big tech. Look, when you use a free product, you are the product. Secure never minds your data and never asks for your phone number. You can easily and securely communicate with both secure users and non-secure users alike, allowing you to send completely secure emails to your doctor, your banker, your lawyer, or anybody else. You can even set a time to destruct the message. Even your internet provider can't peek in on your emails. Secure is your solution to stop the constant theft of your digital identity, and it costs only $5 a month for the messenger or $10 per month for the messenger and email package. Go to secure.com and take back your privacy today. That's S-E-K-U-R.com. Peak Insiders get 25% off, or if you're not an insider, the promo code PEAK15 gets you a limited time 15% off.